So Medlumix is a midwifery uh, medical device company. We're focused in the area of treating atrial fibrillation with a very unique and proprietary catheter, catheter uh, system. Why we're here? We're here, we're raising 12 million euros to basically support the, uh, the uh, finalization of the preclinical development of the product, and then we're going to advance into our clinical studies to, to get initial clinical validation of the device. The device actually combines, uh, uniquely combines RF, uh, RF energy along with the rapidly emerging energy, energy um, source of pulse field ablation. Um, it actually provides uh, the clinician clear vision. It gives them the ability to actually uh, actually evaluate the tissue underneath the, the surface of the heart where there are blading, blading tissue. It'll reduce the complexity of the procedure, it improves the safety of the procedure, and it'll improve the efficacy of the procedure. And that's really our goal. Our goal is to make the, make the, um, make the procedure simpler, but it's to actually reduce the rate of AF recurrence. So we look at the AFib market, it's a very large market, it affects about 35 million people worldwide. Um, it has, a huge, it has a huge economic burden to all the uh, United States, Europe, and, and so forth. Um, it's also a very large expanding market with a high incidence rate annually of about 4.7 million people. Uh, when we look at the current therapies that are available to treat, to treat atrial fibrillation, you have antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, which have a very low success rate. You have catheter ablation, which is better, but it's technically difficult, and the, the rate of recurrence is very high. One of the reasons for that is it's a very blind procedure in terms of being able to evaluate directly um, how the therapy is being delivered and the effects of that therapy. There's a high cost associated with redo patients. 20% um, of patients you know, have two recurrences of AF within the first year. Uh, and then, and then um, when you look at the five-year uh, picture of that, 75% have recurrence of AF within five years. So it's totally unacceptable, and it really makes it difficult to address the significant long-term effects of having AFib, which are significant sequelae. So you have greater risk of heart, greater risk of heart failure, two times greater risk of stroke. That's one of those other things which people are very afraid of having. So we really need to solve this issue in terms of reducing the recurrence rate of AF. Uh, large market, a growing market, uh, really underserved market. Only 1 to 5 percent of patients that have AFib actually receive a catheter ablation. Yet there's $4.1 billion in catheter sales annually. It's really dominated by four major players in the market. And then when you look at energy sources, right now it's dominated by radio frequency, which will still remain to have a role. But right now there's only one major player that has a commercial, uh, commercial device in PFA. That'll change this year, so that PFA piece of the pie will start to expand. And we want to take advantage of both of those energy sources. Radio frequency is really characterized by heat. So when you apply thermal energy to the tissue, uh, if you can't really assess directly in real time how that energy is progressing, you can have, you can have some very serious complications, such, a, such as esophageal injury. You basically burn a hole through the esophagus, which is uh, very frequently a, 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 a fatality uh, for the patient. So that's one of the limitations with radio frequency. Uh, it's very versatile. And when you look at cryo, we're going to apply, we're going to freeze the pulmonary vein using this type of thermal energy. The challenge with cryo uh, is that you're actually putting it into the pulmonary vein, which is actually an artery. So when you deliver, when you deliver, deliver um, freezing energy to that, you can create damage to the pulmonary vein. You can create pulmonary stenosis. Um, this system that you see here is what we call a one-shot device. Very simple to use, very efficient, but it does carry also some uh, complications along with that. Pulse field ablation, I'm sure everybody here has probably heard of that, that's tracking uh, the treatment of AFib. It's a non-thermal energy. It's very efficient. It can be delivered very fast. Uh, it's safer because it's, it's really selective. It's only going to ablate the tissue that we want to, that we want to ablate, and that, those are cardiomyocytes. It's going to leave all the other structures alone, which makes it a safer, a safer choice. The challenge with pulse field, it is very fast. You apply it, you lose all the electrical activity in the heart, and it gives you a, a false sense of security that you've created a durable lesion with PFA. PFA lesions are not immediate, like RF and cryo. They, they mature over time through a process of programmed cell death. So tissue stunning can give you a false sense of security that you've actually created a, a, a durable lesion. And that's the challenge with PFA, and that, and that challenge was actually borne out in one of the first randomized clinical studies between RF, cryo, and PFA. This data was recently released at the ESC in, in, uh, in Amsterdam, and it really showed no improvement in terms of AF, uh, reducing AF, 
AF recurrence in all those energy sources. Granted, the device used, which, which was a first-generation product, it should improve, but there is also a significant amount of serious adverse events as you compare, as you compare it with the other, other uh, modalities. This is our system. It's a complete system. When you look at the catheter, the catheter incorpor incorporates optics into the tip of the catheter. So it gives the physician a 360-degree view of where their, catheter, where their catheter tip is positioned against the tissue. I'll try to use my laser pointer here, uh, which, yeah, there we go. This is an A scan on our GUI. So this, this actually gives them information in terms of how the, how the tip is positioned against the tissue. Is it stable? And do they have contact? Contact's extremely important in making a, an efficient lesion. And if it's not stable, it, it, creates a, it creates a bad lesion. So it gives them information in real time that lets them make real time corrections to how their catheter is positioned. Here you have, um, you have our, uh, whoops, we'll go back. There we go. So here you have an estimated lesion depth indicator. We can actually predict the, the progression uh, of the energy source in terms of, in terms of depth of penetration into, into the heart when using RF ablation. Uh, it's dual energy, so you can use RF or PFA in the same setting on the same catheter. So it gives the physician a lot of versatility. When you look at the, a bit of the science behind it, we use polarization sensitive OCR. So we're using, we're using optics through the catheter and what we're measuring is we're actually measuring the, the, the structural, the structural uh, uh, organization of the tissue underneath the surface that you're ablating. And as we ablate, as we apply energy, whether it's RF or PFA, we can, we can see the disruption of that tissue, and we can correlate to depth of penetration, speed of, speed of ablation, and we can also correlate to, to do we have, have we electroporated cells enough so that those cells will not reconnect after a period of time. So if you look at the way that we use this in, in PFA, this is our, our GUI. This is a property that we measure called biofringence. It's the optical properties that are exhibited by tissue which is organized. As we ablate, we almost immediately see the drop off that biofringence signal. And in 21 seconds, we deliver a full PFA packet, uh, which gives us some very important information. We've been, able to, we've been able to assess with our preclinical data that if we lose 20% of the biofringent signal with PFA, we can accurately predict that you have a durable PFA lesion. And going back, the challenge with PFA is that you apply the energy, you use electrical signal, you wait for a period of time, 20 minutes, you do an adenosine, adenosine check to see if you can stimulate reconnection. If you can't, the clinician feels that the, the, uh, the lesion is durable. The challenge is PFA develops over time. What we actually are, measure is do, have we electroporated those cells enough so they cannot reconnect? And this is one of the key challenges that which is only solvable with this technology currently. So using optics allows us to do that all in real time. And so it, it, the, the system, because it's an optical system, it can also be used in a diagnostic mode. So when you make your, when you make your ablation line, this is an SVC, superior vena cava. So making an ablation line here, you can see these red dots. So what's really nice about this system for the clinician is that they make their ablation points, and then they can use the system to go up and track to see, okay, have I, have I missed a spot? Have I covered all this? And when you look here, when you look above the line, and we're going north to south, you can see the biofringin signal here. So there's no ablation made there, nor, nor was it intended. Over the ablation line, you can see a clear demarcation where the tissue has been denaturized and having a complete lesion. Again, going below the line, you can see the, the, the reemergence of the biofringent signal. It's very sensitive, and it's all been proven out in histology with, with 60, uh, 60 animals have been treated acutely and chronically to, to, bore, to bear, this, there, bear this out. One of the things I'd like to point out is if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you can see a big red dot in the middle of that lesion that was created that shows the selectivity of PFA. The, per the, the blue part is the ablated tissue that we intended to ablate. The red part is the phrenic nerve which we wanted to preserve. So it is a very selective technology and a safe technology. This is really one of the key features of the, of the system. As I said, we can really detect whether you have a durable lesion or not. So when we ablated this particular tissue here, we saw that in the upper left-hand corner, we hadn't lost 20% of the biofringent signal. So from our perspective, we knew that that lesion was going to be reversible. But the EGM activity showed it as being, being isolated. 
we, we let that stay the way it was, and then after 90 days, we went back, excised the heart, and actually looked, and indeed, in fact, there was, there was a reconnection right at that spot. So it shows that it can actually predict, predict what's going to happen to that lesion as you're treating it, and that's what the clinicians need. They need something which they can look at now to determine whether they need to redose to be able to complete a complete, make a complete lesion. Um, our accuracy with RF is, is, is significant. It's 97%. It's very specific and sensitive. Um, using RF ablation, we have a very accurate estimated lesion depth prediction model, which allows the clinician to see in real time how far they're progressing with RF. And keep in mind, it's thermal, so it's very important to know how fast it's progressing and how deep it's progressing so that you know that you have a lesion which is transmural, but let's say not too transmural, where you create, a, where you create an, in an injury like a pop risk. If we go to PFA, again, really just focusing on one point here. In 82% of, of the lesions where we didn't lose 20% of biofringens, those all related into reconnections. When you look at EGM, or the electrical activity, which they measure success by now in the clinic, only 11% were specific enough to know that you had a, a, a lesion which was not durable. And that's really, the, that's really the, the advantage of this system, is that we can actually predict that in real time at the time of treatment. So you know that you have a durable scar before that patient leaves the cath lab, which will reduce the rate of recurrence and it'll address some of those issues that we showed on the first, first couple of slides. Um, this is our timeline. So right now, we're, uh, as I said, we're raising 12 million. That 12 million will cover the rest of the development to prepare for clinical study. And then in 2024, we're going to have a couple of, we're going to have a few different clinical, uh, clinical trials, small trials to be able to show proof of concept clinically with the system. We will look at um, using, the, using the device for RF pure and using the device also for PF Pure. And why are we doing that? We're doing that so we can educate the cl cl clinician how that system works with both of those energy sources. We'll do three month remapping, so we'll be able to show, um, we'll be able to uh, prove out the predictability models that we've put into, uh, put into action. And then we'll, we'll generate a hybrid study where we'll have 25 patients where the physician will be able to use the system as they want, to be able to use RF, potentially in the thicker areas of the heart, where depth of penetration is important, and PFA in areas where they want to, where they want to protect um, uh, adjacent structures, like with the pulmonary veins. So they'll have complete control on how they want to use that energy source. Also being able to use RF and PFA together can have the possibility of further extending the depth of PFA, which then will make PFA uh, to be able to address lesions in the ventricle, which is a very much untapped market that we're going to go after. But first, we're going to, we're going to focus on AF. We've got a really good team internally. Uh, we're based in Madrid. We have a manufacturing partner in California. We have three of the PIs for the pulse field ablation studies at Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and Biosense Webster, who are integrated into our team, uh, work with us on a regular basis in all of our preclinical work and advise us, uh, advise us uh, accurately on what's needed. And we've got a great set of investors who are fully committed to the project. And I'd love to be able to answer more questions about, in more detail about the technology and what we're planning for the next two years. Uh, I guess bottom line, in 18 months, we'll have a very strong value inflection point where we can either create a strategic exit or have enough clinical data to then to be able to raise the capital necessary to do the PMA study after that. Thank you for your attention.